you like to join me in welcoming to the podium engineer Musa Abilo, the executive secretary chief executive officer of the Nigerian Investment Promotion Commission. Thanking Ronnie for making us part of this. So, uh, Mr. Clive, uh, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, uh, mine is uh, to make a presentation on uh, the opportunities that we can, we can I mean, Nigeria's uh, investment environment uh, provides. Now the, the presentation will look at the overview of the Nigerian economy, uh, the legislation that supports doing business, the framework for doing business, investment opportunities, uh, the incentives we offer, and then the mandate of the Investment Promotion Commission. And that will take me to the end of the presentation. Now I normally start with uh, uh, this, this map of the continent of Africa. And I found it necessary to do so uh, because I remember, I think, in 2006, I was in the uh, Philippines. And I made similar presentation. And at the end of the presentation, somebody walked to me and asked me, that, that where is Nigeria in South Africa? So I just felt uh, it was ridiculous that he was such ignorant not to even know where Nigeria is. So I normally start with this to show that Nigeria is located here, South Africa is here, Europe is here. And one interesting thing about this is that from this tip of Nigeria to here, is equidistant to fall on the same tip to somewhere here, which is, uh, there are some islands here. And then the same distance for in the middle of Nigeria to South Africa here is about the same to Europe. So actually Nigeria sits in the middle of the continent. And if you notice, over time, from what starts around DRC, Central Africa, Chad, Niger, Mali, you know, up to Mauritania, hard challenge of development because they needed an economy, stronger economy, bigger economy, to drive their own thinking, to drive their activities. Just like if you take Japan, for example, the entire of that subregion hinged their developments to the Japanese economy. For example, I can tell you, <coughs> as at um, 80s, early 80s, around 1980, Taiwan's per capita was below that of Nigeria. So they had to actually identify what was it that they could supply the Japanese that Japan needed. And they started their economy on rice and banana, supplying rice and banana to Japan, and then sending their people to go and work in the then integrated circuit industry, which were leading into manufacturing, transistor radios, and their likes. Now that's how the Taiwanese started. The same thing if you look at the other countries. They all looked and surged towards Japan to take advantage of their own growth. So in this area, poverty remained perpetuated around this because the Nigerian economy was challenged. And now that the Nigerian economy is moving, you have seen Ghanaian economy has changed. Today they talk of Ghana. But each time they do that, I feel actually people are just wasting their time. Because the economy of Lagos alone can swallow the Ghana, Ghanaian economy. Ghana's population is only 16 million, which is just one-tenth of our population. So if you are talking of markets, Ghana is not the right place to go to. People now locate in Ghana because, <clears throat> perhaps because of their size, 
the, the, the country appears more orderly. But very soon, as they have gotten oil, wait and watch and see what happens in the next seven years. The same Ghanaians that moved back to Ghana, they will be coming back to Nigeria. Now, so if you notice, Chadian economy is doing well now because they have found oil, they have developed it. Niger, which is just right on top of us, they have found oil around this area and they have developed it. In fact, Niger is supplying Nigeria finished petroleum product now. Um, countries like Togo and, and Bene and Togo, of course, have tied their economy to Nigeria, taking advantage of the weakness of our port infrastructure, the delays that we go through. It takes you, at times, two weeks, three weeks. You know, uh, if you are lucky, you have an efficient clearing agent who doesn't believe, believe in cutting corners and costs. You can get your things out in a week. Whereas in these other countries, they have made facilitation much, much easier and faster for you and quicker for you to move out your imports. So a lot of our shipments that actually are consigned to Nigeria end up in these neighboring countries. And they take advantage of that to use those resources that we have, would have captured and used for our own economy to develop their economy. And if Nigeria closes, it enforces closure of borders in this, you find these countries crying. So what I'm saying is that Nigeria now is the equivalent of the Japan that you have that has created development in the in Southeast Asian countries. Just like South Africa has been the major source of development to these countries that are around here. So, Nigeria is the hub, Nigeria is the market, and Nigeria is the right place uh, to do business. I'm sure Clay would have told you, I've uh, been essentially a Nigerian who has spent most of his life uh, doing business there or with Nigerians. Now, the, this one gives you a closer view of the country. Of course, we all know the name is derived from this river, and the rivers uh, two, one coming from the Cameroons, which is River Benue, the other one, which is River Niger, which is all this, and then all discharging through the Delta region, which is the oil rich area. Um, essentially, the distance like this is almost the same this way. So, Nigeria is like a cube, if you like. We have a coastal land area of about 880 kilometers. And across here, I think you require an hour, a flight time of about one hour, 15 minutes, one hour, 20 minutes. Um, this is another resource here that unfortunately uh, we have not taken very good advantage of. We had uh, irrigation schemes and so on to develop agriculture. But because we neglected agriculture because of oil, now the neglect has created a crisis for us in this region, which is the Boko Haram challenge that today we have, which government is now putting the resources we would have put in agriculture, infrastructure, to be able to now make the people here productive. Now we are putting it to fight the insurgency that is in this region. And then down here, because we have made the oil so important, hostage taking has become an issue. Um, claims of who has it and who has not, again, has become another issue. And government is again investing resources uh, in fighting this. But all these are processes of development which every country goes through, whether we like it or not. If you have it good in the beginning, you will face some hell at some point in your development process. There is no country that has had it all through, you know, fantastic. At some point in life, a challenge will be thrown to it. Now, take of recent, we have seen what Philippines has gone through. This is natural. But then it's a challenge to Philippines to, to be able to now think of what happens. There are three instances of such disaster or calamity that has hit that country. So the challenge to the country is now to prepare for the fourth one. Because if they wait for it to come again, then God knows what, what will happen. So we are going through ours at this time, and it's actually helping us to prioritize. So the country capital is here. 
The land area is almost 1 million square kilometers, precisely about 924,000. It's democratic. The population is 167 million. Even though I argue, and that's my own personal opinion, that we don't count those who, are, who die. We just continue to count on the growth rate of around 2 point something percent. Um, then the language, of course, English and the Naira uh, currency, which has stabilized over the last five years, uh, thanks to a very good uh, central bank governor who believes uh, in, in, in doing the real thing and not uh, uh, emulating what others have done, whether rightly or wrongly. And then, of course, the time zone, we are on one plus on GMT. Now, this one gives you a picture of uh, global GDP uh, growth, looking at, again, Nigeria, which is here. Uh, it will look good that we are recording somewhere around 7.6% growth. But then the size of the economy is what matters. Because when you look at, see the advanced economies, you know, see them, they're just managing under 2% two, two growth, you know, within the crisis period. So what matters is how do we take this high up? Now you can see the Ghana I have been talking about. Ghana is recording almost 13%. But for its size, 13% is not even adequate. You know, Ghana should aim at about 20%. For it to be able to now bring its economy as maybe next to that of Nigeria. Yes, 7.6% is good, but then we need to do more to be able to see people looking happy every morning. Because the essence of a good GDP growth rate is the one that translates into a very good GNP. Now, where uh, all this is happening because of few enterprises. Like if you take our telecom sector, you take uh, those in the financial sector, you take, um, you know, these major commodity manufacturers, Unilever, Cadbury, Nestle, uh, which again, there are, are quite few that are driving this growth. Then obviously we need to do, to do much more. We have to look at the real estate sector, which again, uh, global homes is, 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 is part of. You know, the construction industry, as you will see subsequently, is one key area that can actually spread wealth. Because for every construction, it essentially touches nearly 60% of those in the manufacturing sector. And if you do that, you are giving those 60% of the industries uh, jobs to do. And that now will permeate right down uh, to the bottom of the pyramid. So uh, Nigeria needs to do a lot more. The 7% that we have maintained shows that we have kept policies consistent and all attempts to see that uh, there was either change in the policy or some assault of whatever kind uh, was avoided by the government. So everyone kept to it because nobody would want to attribute reduction in this growth rate to his own tenure. So if you look at it from the Obasanjo time to the late Eradua to this president, everyone kept to those policies that uh, he inherited. Now this one gives you, um, there was some noise at some point that, oh, the government was contracting so much domestic debt and so on and so forth. And the, the, the thing was that uh, why should the government go into, you know, buying bonds and then paying high interest rates, encouraging banks actually to even charge, charge higher in terms of interest rates, uh, when there are so many other ways that you can actually generate more revenue internally. Now, the thing is, one, the, the, the ratio is just about 20%. Major economies have gone to 60, 80%, and they are still standing. Uh, so while this challenge was being actually looked into how do we even bring this down, I think suddenly an idea came to government that 
One of the major causes of even having to go and borrow because we have now engaged ourselves in uh, fighting wars on behalf of the region and then internally fighting insurgency is that you budget in a year and then quarterly you keep sending what has been budgeted to the different agencies, you know, in parts. Now, some of them are not able to utilize these resources and they keep them idle in the bank. So government wakes up in, in one day looking for something to use to support maybe an undertaking militarily in, say, Mali. And those resources are not available. You know, when you look at the books, no money. Then you go and float a bond to be able to raise that money to, to support our military to be able to go and do this undertaking. But then in the real sense, if you look at the balance sheets of these banks, there are government monies here and they are kept. So government came and decided that they will centralize now all accounts. Yes, you have this amount appropriated and anytime you have you are prepared, you are ready, you can access it but for on the central account. So that at any time government needs money, it can see for on the picture of what it has unutilized, it can access it, you know, and meet the needs that are immediate. And then when these other en entities of government are ready, they can come uh, and, and also draw for on, for on that center. So that has actually brought this down now substantially. So this one is giving you a picture of the level of what we have as an ex external debt. First is just about 6.7 billion, which tells you that, I mean, Nigeria is so clean, so neat. It can, it can take the, so much space, you know, if we so wish. But then again, government took a policy that we will not borrow unless for cases that make business sense. We will not borrow for social undertakings. So what that means is that they will encourage more of the private sector to go and borrow for investments in the economy, in infrastructure, in other uh, developments that will add value to the economy. Uh, so domestically, again, this is what we have, another six point something trillion. And you can see it's largely the bond that I mentioned, that government had been taken before this decision that has now, now just been taken. Um, and then uh, these are treasury bonds and of course these are treasury bills. So this uh, shows multilateral and then the red is bilateral and this one is the, the commercial which is, which is still small. So we still have a lot more space to accommodate more of such facilities uh, for investment. This, this slide now looks at the sectors. I mentioned to you, uh, take for example telecom. This is a very fast growing sector, but we still need actually investments because uh, these are just the activities of the majors. Because unfortunately, again, most of the small operators have somehow been swallowed by the majors because government has not taken a decision on what kind of service or level or limit of services can the major operators you know, roll out in the economy vis-a-vis -vis what the smaller operators can. So that as long as you don't partition and protect the smaller operators, naturally, by economics of scale, the larger operators will definitely trample over uh, the small operators. And that is what we have seen that has happened. So this sector grows at about between 31 and 33%. Um, and that's, that's the mining sector, uh, hotels and uh, uh, tourism sector, building and construction. Now if we find this more, we will see actually faster growth than this because the impact of the construction sector uh, on an economy is much, much you know, wider than this which is just a service. Of course, it has successfully created a lot of jobs. The umbrellas you see if you go to Lagos or you go to Ibadan or you go to any of the cities that people sit under 
in the from morning till you know early parts of evening uh, are all vending products that support the services that that are here but we can do much more here because the impact of this to so many other operators in the different sectors of industry is much much higher now the same thing with the real estate of course this and this go together um, then wholesale and trade retail are just coming in into Nigeria. Uh, we did something like this presentation, I think, in 2006 in South Africa, in Johannesburg. Uh, and someone in the audience walked to me for a shop right and said, look, I need to talk to you. So we went aside and I listened to him. He said, I want to invite you to go and visit some of our facilities in Johannesburg. I gave him time. We went around. And after I got back home, he sent again that, when next are you coming? We want to take you to the other facilities that we have outside Johannesburg. I took time. I followed them. The next thing is they told me, look, we have made a decision. We want to come and, and try just one outlet in Nigeria. And that's how they started with the one in the pumps. And today, I think if I'm right, uh, ShopRite is talking about 16 locations, you know. And because they are in Nigeria, if you go to the, the, the stock exchange and see how they are listed, you will just see that they have gone more than double their value, you know, before they came to Nigeria. The same thing with the, same, with the, with the MTN. Now, so Nigeria provides you actually with a very, very good destination to invest. And uh, this sector too, very soon you will see it actually rising up to somewhere around this. Um, then businesses and other services, manufacturing, now you can see, because of challenge of power, the energy sector, uh, obviously this continues to remain around this. Finance and insurance, again, this one too is because of high cost of funds, as I mentioned in the beginning. You know, had the costs been lower, then obviously uh, this one would have gone much, much higher than this. Agriculture, you know, uh, this, actually this has moved more than 4%, you know, of the contribution on the overall GDP. The oil and gas continues to fluctuate between over and below because of the, you know, the challenges the operators keep having. Uh, in addition to the unresolved issue of the petroleum industry bill. Because even today in our meeting, it was an issue that came up. The minister spoke and then the operators too mentioned their own challenges. The National Assembly members also mentioned uh, what they are doing uh, about it. So, but on the whole, I think we are still not doing badly despite the challenges. Now this one gives you a picture of and confirming the consistency I mentioned in terms of policies. You can see how it has gone. You know, had there been any negative intervention in between, we would have seen a different picture of this, of this chart. So it's just telling you between 2000 and 2011. Actually, this is not correct. This one is much more than that. This one will go up to somewhere here in 2004 because I remember we recorded a 10.4 percent growth in 2004. So, uh, but all the same, uh, we have continued, you know, to progress uh, progressively. Now, what are the other indicators? We are still battling with this, and that's why, if you remember, when I mentioned that for a GDP uh, to have an impact. We have to see it in the faces of Nigerians. So this is one of the issues that we have. When you talk of inflation, 7.8%. Now, that means the minimum bank will charge you when they lend is this, plus their own costs. Now, their own costs, the minimum they will tell you in Nigeria today is 7%. So 7 plus 7, 14.8. That's why you have interest rate in Nigeria today around that. Otherwise, 
if they just give you a this, then they will not be able to operate. Because what will be left is 0 0.8, and I'm not sure whether their shareholders will agree to keep the management if this, this, is, this is what they will turn back to them. So this is why the cost of fund is very high. And government has to do something about this in consultation with uh, the, the bank operators. Um, so this one gives you the average inflation rate as we have moved, you know. Our foreign reserve is about 45 billion. Um, somebody was asking us a question about this excess crude account. Uh, what excess crude means actually is that when government budgets uh, before the government of President of Asuncho, governments were budgeting on the actual projection of income. That is, if we project 2 million barrels per day over a year at, say, $80, government will budget on the 2 million barrels per day on $80 for the year. And then should, should there be any drop then government is faced with having to find, look for where to, find, to finance the gap or the deficit. Obasanjo came with a policy that if oil sells at 100, less budget, I remember he started with even $60 actually. So less budget on 60 so that we can save the difference. He now used the, the process of that difference to be able to challenge the London and Paris Club on the debt we had over hanging at that time of over $33 billion or so. And that's what we used to pay one third and then get two thirds written off on the condition that we will use part of it to finance what they call today as Millennium Development Goals. And the projects are going on and, and we are seeing some of, some of the benefits. So uh, that's when the idea of excess crude came. Because the excess crude here means the difference between the, the going price and the benchmark price that we have used for our budget is normally saved. And then after a certain time, when government is comfortable that even if there is any volatility or challenge to the pricing, uh, there may not be the need to actually fall back on that saving, then a portion of it is now shared to the states again and the local governments and the federal government. So I think this has dropped substantially. It used to be quite uh, something quite really big. Uh, and of course, our exchange rate has remained uh, around um, 155, 156. Now, uh, these are some of our in indicators uh, that has, have supported, you know, the uh, the growth of the GDP. Actually, this chart and the one that I showed previously have a correlation. Now, we created, again, as another innovation, trying to do what we should have done during the days of General Yakubu Gawan, when he was the head of state, that time no parliament, nothing, he had so much money. We could have done what we are doing just maybe what we have done in about two, three years ago. Kuwait did the same. United Arab Emirates did the same. Today what they started with, I think around $100 million has, has grown into almost a trillion dollar uh, you know, investment. If we had done the same by then, we would have had a lot of resources at our disposal to address our infrastructure challenge. But unfortunately, I think the idea never came at that time. So we have created a sovereign wealth uh, fund which has this authority as the one managing. And I think they are starting well. Uh, some of the resources will be invested in our infrastructure needs internally. Uh, some, of course, will be invested uh, elsewhere. Some will go into private equity and venture capital globally, you know, to take part in funding strategic projects that uh, will, will, at least, will be of value to, to the fund. Uh, these are some of our credit ratings. Um, 
we have remained BB minus still. Uh, and then our euro bond is doing well, you know. Um, I think it's, uh, it was in London here that they, they, they launched it. So uh, to show again that there is uh, confidence in the, in the economy. Now, this one gives you uh, the trends in investments in, in Nigeria for, for, for the year. Now you can see the top 20 highest FDI rate of return. Nigeria happens to be one of the uh, major countries. We are being cited as about 36%, but I suspect this is actually giving you an average. Because from the records we have in our office, uh, we have known those that have returned up to 70%. In fact, there is a business I personally know that because it's so good, they have so much in terms of offers of, of financing to expand, and they are just expanding on yearly basis. So the summary of our economic performance, we are talking about 6.75, but like I said, we should do much more than that. We should target 10, you know, and then move towards 12, 15. If we can do that, then obviously we'll see ourselves as one of the advanced economies. Um, power is our major challenge. It has limited our ability to attract bigger investments, heavy uh, industrial investments. And I hope uh, as we commission the 10 new power plants that will add additional almost 4,500 megawatts into the national grid, we should be in position to see improvement in stability as well as uh, inflow of additional investments. Um, I mentioned our foreign reserve. And then this mint <coughs> actually is an acronym uh, by Jim O'Neill of Goldman Sachs. Uh, he felt that why, whereas you talk of the BRICS, there are other countries that look alike in terms of prospects. You know, fast on high rate of return, and then uh, in, in so many other things that appear common to these four countries. And that's Mexico, India, Indonesia, Nigeria, and Turkey. Um, and then, of course, we have been the highest recipient of FDI uh, in 2013. In 2012, we recorded 8.9 billion. If you look at the UNCTAD World Investment Report, uh, you will see that. Now, so what are those things that have made actually these enterprises that have contributed to our GDP growth rate uh, possible? Now, the NIPC Act, that is the Investment Promotion Commission Act 16 of 1995, uh, has specifically provided for 100% ownership. Whether you are a Nigerian or you are a foreigner, you don't need a partner. You can own your investment 100%. If you so wish to have a partner, of course, it's your own decision. Uh, we can support you to identify uh, such partnerships. Now, outside negative lists, and these negative listed items are actually four, alcohol, tobacco, and narcotics, and firearms. If you need to invest in any of this, you will need to get approval of government. Um, other than that, you can just walk in incorporate your company, start your business. Uh, and then if you are in the maritime, thus the Cabotage Act again limits your access to all the benefits. You have to pick a Nigerian partnership uh, up to a certain limit of percentage, which I think may be about 10%, just like you have in the Nigerian Content Act. And the idea of Nigerian Content Act is actually to help Nigerians develop the skills and the capacity to provide services that the major operators require in the oil and gas. What government realized was that the major operators were importing their own, uh, I can say, brothers off 
to come and provide the same service which a Nigerian company could do. So government came with this legislation to be able to limit you know, their ability to access all the benefits by enabling Nigerians to at least provide 10% of, of such. For example, simple supply of products like the bottled water, the gloves they require to use, the jackets they need, I mean, overalls or top coats or whatever, the boots, you know, all of them used to be brought in from offices. When you can just contract a Nigerian company to, to provide that service. So this act provides that. So outside this, uh, then any other thing you can, you can actually own 100%. Uh, this one, this act again provides protection against expropriation. Uh, government will not seize your investment just because somebody, somebody feels that he can do so. They can't. This act protects you as the investor uh, from uh, suffering that kind of abuse. Uh, unless if it comes on extreme you know, uh, national security or interest that is of overriding over that. And if that happens, government obviously will have to compensate you. Uh, and then you can repatriate your profit, your dividends, and even your investment uh, resources should you desire to just log off uh, from, the, from the economy. Nobody will ask you. Once there is evidence of how these resources come into the country, you just tender that, and then you can process uh, to take out your things. And then we have other sector-specific uh, regulations that, again, support uh, your ability uh, to do even much more than what we have listed here, which are just across the board. Now, so to do business, in Nigeria, luckily the CAC is sitting here with us. Um, when you come to us in the NIPC, um, the next place we will send you, if you don't have an incorporated company, is the corporate registry. Uh, they search for the name and then they block it for you for about, I think, 60 or 90 days? 60. Yes, they block that name for you for 60 days so that you can process uh, the incorporation. And if you meet all the requirements, they can give you a certification by the next day, in 24 hours. Um, if there is a foreign participation in that investment in Nigeria, assuming you come in, okay, you own the investment 100%, then you must come to us to notify us that Oh, I am bringing in $1 million. No, I'm starting my business with $5,000 so that we can take note of that capital that has come in. And then we give you uh, a certificate. Ours does not take longer than two hours. If you just come in, fill all the requirements, submit copies of what we need. In two hours, you wait. We'll get you a certificate signed by any of my directors and uh, you get to business. Um, then, of course, after you finish with the corporate registry, the tax man will be there waiting for you. You have to register with them for value-added tax as well as the corporate tax. Um, then, if you now need to go to a specific sector, uh, if it is in the financial sector, you will need the Central Bank of Nigeria, or you may need the Securities and Exchange Commission. Um, if you are in the mining, you need the Ministry of Mines and Steel Development, or the Mining Cadastre Office, you know, or the Geological Service Agency of Nigeria. Um, if you are in the power sector, you will need the Electricity Regulatory Commission. The ICT, you will either need the NIDDA, which is National Information Technology Development Agency, or the Communication Commission, all the two of them. Uh, if you are in the food and pharmaceuticals, and what is popularly known as NAVDAC, you will need a national agency for food, drug administration and control. If you are outside this, now assuming what you manufacture is this speaker system, the standards organization will have to give you uh, a standards certification 
that yes, it meets our on-set standards, and then uh, you can manufacture them in that level of standardization uh, for distribution in the economy. And then if it is environment related, uh, there is uh, environment ministry as well as an agency that is actually responsible to regulate uh, investments that have impact on the environment. Now these are some of the investment opportunities. Uh, they are not exhaustive, but we just suggest some of those that uh, may be of appeal to you. Um, the incentives we have, uh, there is those that are in the statutes. Uh, we have five years corporate tax holiday. Now the entire idea of this actually is to help you uh, to be able to stabilize over the first five years. Uh, because when it was first launched, you know, the challenges actually in the economy were much more than what we have today. Uh, take for example, as at 1999 when we came, the total power available to the country was 1,380 megawatts. Now, I mean, you can just imagine nothing existed. Because even then, the rationing was a matter of you have power two hours and then it goes till the next day another two hours. Uh, so government introduced this kind of incentives to actually cushion the impact of those uh, deficiencies that we had in our infrastructure. Uh, but it's still uh, relative now because it has actually helped so many companies that have grown so large today through the savings they have done in this to be able to reinvest. Simple example I can give you is the Nangote Group. Uh, they have re-injected some of these savings into so many of the cement plants that we have in the country that has made us essentially self-sufficient uh, in cement manufacture. Uh, you can repatriate your profit 100%. Uh, Nigeria may be the only country I know that will allow you to take out all your profits. In most other countries, they will insist that at least 25% of this must be re-injected back into either expansion or something else in the economy, you know. But we have been able to actually uh, withstand, you know, all this. So that shows how strong our frame is to this kind of shocks. And I must tell you one thing. Uh, for example, the central bank governor was, was asked that what, what do they do to, 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 to mitigate the kind of challenges they have seen other countries fall into, particularly when something is about to happen in the United States. And smartly, he said that they have, they have been tracking statements coming from the Reserve Bank governors of the US. Anytime they make a statement, they sit and analyze and look at the implication and take measures immediately. So that that's how they have been protecting the Nigerian economy from what would have, would have been happening to others who just sat and watched and wait to see whether what the Reserve Bank governor has said, you know, is going to happen. They have taken measures already to protect it. And I think through that uh, smartness, we have seen a lot of uh, stability uh, in our economy. Now, we have this generous capital allowance. If you invest in research and development, you will get a capital allowance of 140 percent. Assuming you spend one million dollars in research and development, you will get 1.4 million dollars. Government will not give you cash, but when you come to retire to the tax authorities, then you now take out this capital allowance uh, provided and then pay the difference. If what you are paying is actually not even up to what it is, you have a credit that you can carry forth to the following year. And then if you use local raw material, now up to 20% of the total value of the input of your local raw material, government will give you an incentive over five years of 20% of what you have put in, you know, uh, per annum, so that in five years you take back the total cost of 100% as an incentive. What I'm saying is assuming in 100 parts, 
of your local raw material, I mean raw material needs, 20% of it, that is 20 portions, are sourced locally. Now, in five years, that gives you 100%. Now, what the government does is to now say, okay, the 20%, which is those 20 portions, we spread it over five years, and then you take back one portion, you know, per annum, over a five-year period, so that you get back full of the equivalent of what you source locally. The whole idea is to encourage you to source all your local raw materials internally, so that you don't need to import it. You help the government to save uh, resources for an import. Uh, and then, of course, our VAT, uh, 5%. I'm sure those of you who are in this country would wish that your VAT is 5% too. <laughs> because I know how much you pay, in addition to so many other taxes. Now, if you are in uh, free zones, of course, um, you, you, you don't, if you import, if you bring in an uh, expatriate, you don't need a permit to bring him in, as long as he works for you in the free zone. Um, before, it used to be actually uh, absolutely tax-free, but now government has set a limit so that after a certain number of years, you will begin to pay a corporate tax, even though you are operating in the, in the free zone. Then we introduced the export expansion grant. Now this one again is, as I said, as a result of the higher cost of doing business. Uh, government came up with this so as to encourage us to manufacture and export, uh, create more jobs internally, because we support the entire sub-region as I said, a population of almost 400 million. So this one, if you export, say, $1 million worth of manufactured products from Nigeria, whether you as the manufacturer or as a trader who buys from the manufacturer, you will be entitled to 30% of the value of the export as an export expansion grant. Now, the, the essence of this is, first, we know the, the, the cost of doing business is high. You have to uh, provide your own power. You know, you are, you are, you are operating actually <clears throat> a small colony where the power, the water, and security, and so on are all your own responsibility. Now, this is to help you bring down those costs. So, assuming you slice this into two and surrender half of it to the consumer across the border, obviously, it will make your products competitive. So you will, you will now tie him to you as a major consumer of your product. And that keeps your enterprise going. Uh, and of course, it keeps him too as your consumer from the other end uh, in business. So government introduced this, but they don't give cash. They give you instruments that you can use to pay import duties, uh, such other charges that, you ha that are statutory that you must you must pay government when you enjoy. Now, there are other uh, incentives like employment tax relief. These ones came, I think, in the last two years also uh, as an incentive to encourage investors to employ uh, more Nigerians uh, so as to create jobs. Uh, and then there is that of infrastructure. Uh, what this means is that if you, have, if you locate in a place where such an infrastructure doesn't exist, and you have to provide it yourself. It entitles you to a certain level of incentives. Um, then, of course, government has now given priority to sugar development locally. Uh, what he's saying is that all the machinery to process sugar uh, will come in duty-free. Um, then, automatically, you enjoy five-year corporate tax holiday. And then if you, are, if you are adding value to a raw sugar, bringing it from some other country, then your duty is this, and then you have to pay levy of this. Now, the essence of this actually is to discourage, to, to try to encourage sourcing uh, locally. And then if you are bringing in refined sugar, the duty is this, 20%, and the levy is 60%. And then aircrafts I will now come in um, duty-free and value-added tax-free. Uh, mining machineries, the same thing. Agriculture machine, the same. 
the power sector, machineries, the turbines and associated equipment, they will all come in duty free. Um, and then, of course, there are these other fiscal incentives that have been introduced under the same uh, legislation. A tax relief on interest income and then capital asset depreciation allowances. Um, we assist. If, for example, any one of you is coming to Nigeria, he calls me or he sends me email or he sends me a text message, uh, obviously, I will take him serious. We will arrange to receive him. If he wants appointment, we will organize that appointment for him uh, and then be part of the entire uh, discussions to be sure that he's committed. And if there are hitches, we'll be able to now intervene and, and, and take him out. Um, then, of course, we look at what is workable, what will help the economy. And we attract those kind of investments. And then, if you come with good ideas, we listen to you. We can even recommend to you that, look, put it in writing to us so that we can look at it at our own level and then we move it forward so that government can uh, adopt it as part of those measures that will further enhance our capacity uh, to attract more investment. Now, this meeting that I have come to do with Mr. President here, uh, which is called Honorary International Invest Investor Council, it's an advisory council of Mr. President, is the one that gave birth to this. In one of our meetings, of course, if we had pushed it ourselves, it would have been tougher. But as I, as I mentioned by one of the members, we saw an opportunity that now what we wanted to do, we have been just helped by this push. So government took a decision to create this service. And what this service does is actually to remove bottlenecks. If you come today, for example, uh, you need to incorporate a company, as I said. If you go to the Corporate Affairs Commission office, um, yes, you can walk in there, but then you have to join the process. If you come to our office, it's only one desk that you will find. You talk to the gentleman there, he takes whatever you need, asks you to bring whatever is required, and then he tells you to go gives you time, by the time you come back, your things are ready. Even if they are not ready, he can give you an update. Oh, we are here, we had this IT glitch, or oh, we had this, and by so-so day, you will get your things ready. So the center is actually to remove the challenges uh, that we have had in the past, uh, getting people to know what to do when they needed a support or service. Um, so it's efficient, it's transparent, um, and we have 26 agencies of government are in the center currently. And we can do incorporation or registration of ordinary companies, grant approvals, permits and licenses, licenses and then investment information and access to data. We are planning to create more centers uh, in this key uh, cities, Lagos, Port Harcourt, and, and Kano. So, that's about all. And uh, if you have questions, please feel free and ask me. Uh, and this is how you can reach me should the need for that arise. Thank you very much.